is Mike Miller Nielsen from Java Code Geeks, and I'm going to teach you how to write clean, efficient code using the JVT signed token. If you are interested in security, if you want to build a secure application, a secure solution, if you want to integrate with the cloud, then this video is definitely something for you. Because I'm going to explain to you what the JWT token is, uh, what it consists of, and how to use it. Now, complementary to this video, there will be related articles in the description below. Also, take the time to visit yamakokeeks.com, where we have other programming-related articles and also videos. Now, uh, before we start, then please take the time to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell, so you know when we have more stuff coming up. Without any further ado, let's get started. JWT stands for JSON Web Token. And it is a standard for how a, a web token actually should look like. There are many ways to implement it, and it is not easy. But, uh, but it's good that we have a standard for, for how to actually generate this um, JWT or JSON Web Token. JSON is a quite is a good format because uh, whenever you see JSON, then you can easily transport, uh, transfer it and, <coughs> and convert it into a uh, into a programming object. It doesn't matter whether it's Java or .NET or whether it is. But when you are dealing with JSON, then it is kind of one to one how your uh, how your Java object should look like. If you're dealing with uh, XML instead, then you actually don't know there's not a one to one conversion into uh, programmable objects. And that is why JSON is such a good format. And that is why it was chosen for um, as a basis for the JWT, the JSON web token. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, the situation is that uh, we have a user, that is the smiley face right here. So this, uh, this is the client, the, this is uh, me or you. And we want to access a something called a resource server. That is that's just an application server that provides some information. And in this situation, it will be a weather forecast server. So we need to get we need to get the weather forecast, but um, we need to be authenticated because or else the, the weather the weather forecast application will not just give weather forecast out to people who haven't paid for the service, of course. So uh, we, so it needs to know that uh, who uh, yeah, that we are authenticated and uh, that it's okay that we actually um, get the response and the weather forecast for tomorrow. So that is that is the problem we, that we are trying to solve in this scenario right here. Then the first thing is uh, we have a authorization server, and uh, this authorization server it can be uh, it can be the Google Cloud, it could be use, it could be AWS, it could be Azure, it could also be uh, a key, uh, something called a key cloak server that you set up yourself. It's, it's quite easy to set up and it's uh, free, and you can just spin up a Docker image with this if you want to try to set up the authorization server uh, for yourself. It's um, There's a web API where you can go in and define some users, and then you can uh, log in with basic auth if you want to, uh, and then you can get your the uh, JWT returns. So that is, uh, I would definitely recommend you to to to, to play around with Keycloak if you um, if, if you if you like JWT if and if you like to dig more into security and if you want to create your own custom security solution. But nowadays it's actually more uh, normal that the cloud will handle the uh, the authentication. They have their own IAM. Uh, system that they that they want that they're using, and uh, most of these clouds, or actually all of these clouds, actually also accept a JWT uh, token, a JSON Web token. Um, so the the flow here is that first we need to authorize against this authorization server, and this can happen in a lot of different ways. It can actually happen with a self signed um, JWT. That's one way to to, to do it, and uh, you can also use basic authentication, which means that you can just send a username and password in the header as usual. And you can also send a maybe just a secret or a um, an, an API token. That is totally up to what the author authorization server uh, provides and supports. So there's no rules for that. Uh, yeah. The, the, but the, what there are rules for is what what is returned if if you uh, if 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 you are, if you need to get a uh, if you get a JWT return, then it has a certain, it has a certain, uh, there's a standard around it. So there's a header, there's a payload, 
and there's a signature. So at, at JW team, and I'll, I'll just show an example for how it actually, uh, how it can look like. And uh, yes, it looks very complex. And yes, uh, you cannot, it's not readable uh, per default. That is because it is base 64 encoded. And it consists of three areas. Every time you see a dot uh, like this, every time you see a dot, um, then it is actually a new section that starts. So the so this part right here, this is the header, and it's base 64 encoded. That's why you cannot read it. But if you just decode it, uh, base 64 re de uh, decode, then you can actually read the header. So there's nothing secret around the header. The header contains information about what it is that we are doing. That is, it's a JWT, and also which. Uh, which algorithm to use when to, to verify uh, that it has been signed correctly. Then we have a second part, that is the payload right here. And again, that is, uh, it is open for everybody to read it. Uh, people, they, people don't need to have, um, yeah, to have any special access. They can read it because it is just base64 encoded. So do not place anything secret or anything uh, sensitive in the payload. That's very important. And the payload, it has something called claims that is uh, that is uh, fields that 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 is actually provided uh, along with this uh, along with this uh, token right here so we have a header that describes what is the uh, what kind of algorithm that we're using we have a payload right here that uh, gives us some information what is it, which application are we trying to uh, connect to who are we what is the usually there's an email for for yeah, for for who we are and there's usually also an um, an expiration uh, date inside of the timestamp for when the, the token actually expires. And then we have the last part, and this is the um, this is a, this is where the security lies. This is a signed um, this is a, a signed version of the header base sixty four encoded plus the payload sixty four encoded. Then we can sign this with a private key if we use the RS, uh, RSA standard. Uh, that uh, there are multiple standards. There's also something called uh, HMAC, which will just use a secret. Um, I personally like the, the the approach with having a private and a public key uh, because then you have your private key yourself, and you you cannot give this to anyone. But it, when you sign when you sign the token with that private key, when you sign the token, then people can see that it's you because the, the, the public key is uh, open and available for, for everybody. If you use any of the cloud solution, then there's actually always a an endpoint where the cloud, where the public key can be reached openly to everybody because then you can then verify that this message and this um, or uh, this, uh, this claim that you have for, uh, you know, for for access is actually true. And this is actually this is the whole point with the JWT. It is to prove that you actually have access to um, yeah to whatever resource that you're trying to access. So it is it is a, it is a key. Uh, so it's a key that um, that has some more information uh, about it. So it, yeah, it's it's a key in which bit of information. So let us try to go back here again to um, to the overview right here. So we have the client, and here we here we have an example of the day of the JW team of the JSON Web Token. First of all, uh, we have this type right here. It says JWT. If if this is not on, then this is not a JWT token, and then it could be something else, right? So that is um, that is quite uh, important, and this is almost always right here. And this is one of the, the the standard checks that this this piece of information is right here. Then we have something called algorithm right here, and this is very important. And uh, I think that the most uh, okay the 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 most normal um, the, the most the most used algorithm that I see is RS two five six, but of course there are other algorithms, and of course you need to you need to agree with your authorization. Uh, actually, you need to need to agree with the provider of your resource server and also your authorization server. Which standard that you use? It's very important that you use the same same standard. This is all in the header, so this is so when we verify this token. Uh, so when 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 Whenever the authorization gets a please verify this token, then it knows how to verify it, and it knows how, uh, what yeah which approach to use with math to apply um, to, to this to this JWT right here. Then there's a payload, and this is where it gets uh, very interesting because here we have a lot of information, and this information usually also uh, or this information has to match um, it has to match whatever um, is expected from. The resource server, uh, and sometimes also from the authorization server, because the authorization server will verify these uh, these pieces of information right here. 
Uh, this is a this is an example with the Google Cloud function right here, and uh, here we have the, the the sub needs to be there. That's a subject, and this is called the uh, these are the default claims, the claims that will, are always there, um, and that these usually um, if you are if you're communicating with Google, then this needs to be your service account email. Uh, if you're using a service account, in this situation we are using a service account, um, so that is what we need to put in here. Then we have the audience, that is the receiver, so that is usually an endpoint um, of, of some kind. Then we have NBF, that stands for not before, that means that this token cannot use before, this data set is right here. This is usually stamped to the current uh, time, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, in, in milliseconds since uh, 1970. So this is the, 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 the default timestamp right here. And then we have target audience, and this is actually something called a custom claim. This is only used by, this is something that is used by Google, and Google have invented their own uh, target audience claim, and then they have, then they say that this uh, target audience should match with the cloud function URL. So when you try to call the cloud function URL, then the target audience should be set to the same URL. And then we have the issuer again. That is who are who are we that actually issued it? And um, in this situation, of course, it was the authorization server that issued this JWT. This, JWT. this means that the issuer would, uh, would usually be the authorization server, something, something, um, and that's that's it. So that's how we can see who who created this token right here, because there are a lot of different implementations. Um, it could be a, a self-signed. Um, uh, a self-signed token that, that we just created ourselves. Sometimes we create this, these tokens ourselves, actually, and other times um, they are created by the authorization server. Then we have a, a EXP that stands for ex 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 uh, expiration time, and that can, if you are communicating with the uh, cloud, especially with, the, uh, with Google, there's a there's a maximum time of 60 minutes. So this this need, this can um, maximum be 60 minutes uh, in, in the future, this expiration time right here. And the more the the lower the 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 yeah the the it, it it's good to not to have a long lived um, token. It needs to be a short lived token because that is more secure, of course. So if someone intercepts it, then you only have like maybe ten minutes to use it. If you set it to ten minutes, you can also maybe set, you can also set it to maybe some sometimes three minutes or four minutes. It always it all depends on your timeouts in your system. Um, what you can also see right here, if you have a web solution, then of course, then you it is very normal to have a, a timeout for maybe fifteen minutes or maybe a whole hour. Um, and when that when that hour approaches or the fifteen minutes approaches, when the when when, when the threshold approaches, then you would use something called a refresh token. But we will talk about that in the end of the video. So. So this is the payload, and it can contain whatever in here. But uh, there, as you can see here, there's a standard, right? And we will go through the standard, right? Uh, yeah, in in just in just a minute, um, because there, there are some uh, some fields that uh, yeah uh, that we that we should always should use. And then there's a, actually a public registry. So that means that if you have a good idea to a um, to, an, to a piece of information that should be uh, registered publicly, and, and 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 the reason for registering it uh, publicly is that then no one else would actually use this as a custom um, as a custom claim. Um, and that is good because then you don't use the same names. But usually what people do is they use the default claims and then they use the custom claims. It is, um, it is not always that they, they care about the public registry claim. Um, so so that is the payloads. A lot of information right here. We have a yeah, we have the payload with a lot of pieces, uh, with some pieces of data of what what is it that we are trying to get access to, and who are we, and when does uh, yeah, when is it created the the the, the, the token, and um, when does it expire? And uh, then we have the signature itself. The signature itself can be uh, can be uh, yeah, can be created in many different ways. One way is the RSA way, and there's also the HMAC way. Um, and there are also other uh, implementations of this. But what is important is that this signature would actually um, ensure that no one else can pretend that they are that they are actually you and that they have created this right here, that they have uh, that, that they have supplied this information right here, and that is done uh, by taking the base sixty four encoded version of the header and added to the sixty four base encoded version of the payload. 
and then to sign it somehow. And sign actually means encrypt, right? So that means it is it is encrypted in, in, in some way, it's signed in some way, but that, that can be verified later on with a public key or with the secret. If you use HMAC, then you just have a secret. You don't have private and public keys there. <clears throat> so when we get this JWT back after we uh, authorized, so in, in this situation, there was the author, uh, authorization server that actually created this JWT, and then we... Um, and 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 now we have that JWT token. What do we what do we do with it? We actually add it in the header. So that means that when we send a request to the resource server, then we add in the header um, something like this. I'll show right here. So this is our request. So so first we uh, so first first we send this uh, authorization authorization request to the authorization server. And uh, in the header right there, we had a barrel here. We could have. Tokens or credentials. Basic authentication is just username, colon, uh, password, and then base64 and code that. Uh, so that is that would be in that situation. Then we would um, then get a response like this. Token ID, blah, 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 blah. And this token ID would then look like you see in the top right here. So this is an example of the, of the value in the token right here. Um, so in this situation right here, then we will then, the next request we will send to the resource server will then Contain a header with uh, with the authorization colon barrel still, and then we would then use the new token that we actually got the the JWC token that we just got from the authorization server, and then the resource server and the resource server it can be it can just be a it can it can actually be uh, the cloud itself, so the cloud provider itself. So sometimes you would actually um, first authorize yourself against it could be AWS, Asia, or Google. And then you will call one of the functions, you will try to call some of the, the, the functions that they have inside, you will try to call one of the servers inside. That server again would then go and ask uh, Google or uh, AWS or Asia's authorization server, is this token that we just got right here, is it valid? So, and then it's just a, a true false. It's a, it's a, can you please verify this uh, token, including all of the claims? Sometimes, if the if the claim did not follow the standard of your cloud provider of your authorization server, then you can get a um, a, a nice message back that says that please you uh, please also add target audience, please add add target target audience, or or else you or else we will have to deny your request. Um, and that and that is that is a, that is that is a good thing because that that would, that would actually help you. Uh, give the right claim uh, in, in the information, and, and usually these checks would actually be done before the uh, b before the b before the signature uh, check, and that is because all of these information right here they are publicly available, and you can you can always see it by just the base sixty four decode the middle part of the of the token. Um, and yeah, sometimes you will also get a message back that yeah, the uh, expiration time uh, that you have right here. It's it can also be it can be out uh, your whole token can be outdated, right? It's like, um, that can also be it can, it can be expired. Uh, that could also be a response. But most of the times, of course, you would get a okay, everything is fine, you are verified, and then um, the resource server is then programmed to give you your response back. So this could then be the response body, the response payload would then say, yeah, day tomorrow and forecast is sunny. So then we got the weather forecast for, for tomorrow. That's quite good. That's quite good. So so this this was one scenario. This was one scenario. Another scenario I want to show you. And security is difficult. So uh, sometimes it can make, make sense to read up on it multiple times and also um, yeah, also watch videos, of course, multiple times and then just try it out yourself and then at some point it will be, um, it, it will actually make sense. Another scenario, another scenario, and that is actually the one that we are, I'm going to show you code examples for today. And this is, again, the authorization server in this situation is Google. This is the Google Cloud. And Google Cloud can actually take a, a JSON web token and convert that into Another token that is identity token signed instead, and this is actually this is a standard approach. If you have a if you have a um, service account, uh, if you have a service account and you downloaded a key from the from that service account in there, you would have a private key, and then you can use that to create this JWT right here, and then the authorization uh, server will then give you a new 
JSON web token back that you then can use to access the weather forecast cloud function. So this is another. Um, so the the first request can actually be a re, that the, the can actually be a request where you use a, a self signed JWT. Um, so that is uh, that that is one way um, that that is one way to authenticate yourself uh, against the authorization server. And or else then the flow is exactly the same. The authorization server will save that uh, save the the, the new uh, JSON web token, and then when you try to access the resource server, that can be the cloud function, for instance, then the cloud function will then ask that authorization server, "Is this token okay?" And then uh, the, and then it will actually then it will reply, "Yes, everything was okay. Please deliver the forecast, the weather forecast to the end uh, to the client." So those are two different approaches. One approach is where you can use basic authentication or another authentication. Uh, and uh, one approach is that you can actually start with a JSON web token that you have signed yourself and then uh, and then move on from there. But the, the, what is actually common always is that you need to some kind of, you need to send an authorization request and then you get a new token that you then can use. One last thing is that that's actually a third setup also because Google, um, the Google Cloud actually supports something called an API gateway. The API gateway can actually help you. So when you connect to the API gateway, you will actually give your own self-signed token along with the request where you want to uh, that that you want to uh, along along with the the request to the to, to the resource server. Then you will give your own private signed uh, JWT, then when you hit the API gateway, then it is so service-minded that it will actually go to the authorization server and then it will actually change the header of your requests so it contains the new token instead of your original token. This means that then you, then you will only have one call. You will just have one call to the API gateway. But that is because the API gateway supports that functionality. I will not show you an example of this in this video right here, but the API gateway is definitely very convenient with this, and it also uh, it also provides the possibility to um, orchestrate different uh, endpoints to different servers and to different backends. Um, so I just want to mention that to you that if if you are if you're communicating with an API gateway. Then, then, and you don't understand why. Uh, why are you only uh, supplying the first, the first uh, JSON web token, and everything actually works fine? You are allowed. That is because your API gateway uh, actually gets the new, uh, gets the new to token, places that in the header, and then connects to the uh, cloud function or the cloud run application or whatever, uh, whatever the backend consists of. Is the yeah so that's just nice to know. Um, but else this this is the flow every time. Sometimes you just don't uh, see a part of the flow if you use the, the API gateways uh, gateways in the cloud. Okay, before we move on with some code examples, I want to show you some web resources where you def that you definitely need to know about. One of them is JWT.io. Um, here you can actually paste in your token. Then you can then they will, then they will actually uh, convert it. Uh, they will JSON decode it to um, yeah the header part. So there you can see the header part is uh, JWT and it's uh, H has two five six. That is the the encryption algorithm. You can also see the body is right there. The body is right here. It's, uh, it's we have a subject. This is just a number, and then we have a name John Doe. I at this is, means that it's issued at I at is issued at time. So it, it is almost the same as not before. Um, sometimes you would have the situation where you have uh, an issued token at right now, but then you want it to be used uh, in the future, and then you can use the not before uh, to a field actually also. The not before token is a uh, field is not that it's not that uh, it's not that usual, but it is there. So you need to know about the AWTIO. Uh, uh, every time you're stuck, that this would uh, definitely be my first place to go. Um, because there are first of all, you can debug your tokens right here. You can set them right here, and um, and if you use something like like this here, you here you have a secret because this is just the HMAC. Um, this is the HMAC approach. Here you only have a secret. You don't have a private or public key. But also, if you have if you're using the RSA uh, method, the RS two five six method, then um, uh, then then you would actually be uh, then you could actually paste in your private and your public key, and then you could then 
get a signature verified or not in, in, uh, on this page right here. So you can test your tokens. That's really cool. You can test your, you can also test your keys. Um, that is also really cool. And if you have some kind of programming language that you, where you would like to use and implement this, you maybe would like to implement your own authorization server. That is totally possible. Then you can, or you can also, or maybe you want just want to uh, create and sign the JWT token uh, themselves. Then you go to libraries. Then you'll find your the library that you need. This is .NET library. So then. Um, I'm usually programming in Java, so that is my main language. Language, so I'll go to Java, and the 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 library that I'm using in these in this in today's example is this library right here, the first one right here. And the reason why I chose that was because it had the most star. It had the uh, fifty four uh, one thousand and uh, stars right here, as you can see right here. And there's also a nice GitHub repository where there are code examples. There's a community behind it. It is um, it, it is it is widely used. So. Here we can see this is, these are the claims that are that is being that are being checked so far. So that means that if, if these yeah, so it, when you try to verify something, then uh, then you can check for these uh, these claims right here. Another thing, uh, there's a very very good introduction right here also. So uh, what is a web token? Then you can read about that. And here you can see it consists of a header, payload, and signature. And again, there are good examples all the way down here. There was one thing down here I want to show you. Um, that's also how it works. A drawing that's almost uh, the same as what you what you just saw. Um, uh, what was it that I want to show? I want to show the claims because the claims, uh, the payloads, uh, the yeah, the payload claims. That is what uh, what we can actually see here. In here somewhere, then there's, here we have a payload here. There's something called this. These are the register claims. So these are the official ones that we have gone through until now. The the issuer, um, the expiration time, subject, audience, etc. Those are called register claims. And you can get a list of them uh, right here. If you want to have a list of all of them right here. And there's also an explanation on when they should be used. Uh, most of the authorization servers, they are so nice that they will actually just tell you that you have to add this uh, claim uh, if you haven't added enough claims. So that's a good, that's a good thing about it. Then you have the public claims right here, and uh, this is where we have a registry. I've already opened that. Um, I've already opened that. This is right here. So this is the public. This is a public registry for claims, and um, the only reason to use this, is, as I said, is that um, if someone else. If if you want to create a custom claim, okay, it is actually quite useful because when when you want to create a custom claim, you could choose uh, to use one of the existing one that are already there, and then say in your specification that this is using the public claim name, and then everybody then everybody knows ah okay this is the name and this is with this description right here, the same with the picture and all that, and also if you want to create your own custom. If you want to create your own custom claim that does not exist, then you can check that whether it already exists or not before you actually use it. Because if you suddenly put on a, a new definition of name and where, where this name maybe it might in, in your own uh, custom uh, definition is only the first name, for instance, then it is not it's not that good because people would actually expect that this would be full name because that is the public definition of this claim. So if you use custom claim and you don't want to use the existing definition that is already there. Then take a name that is not that is not already there. Right? That's yeah. That is why we have the pu public uh, claims right there. Okay. So and then we have the pri okay when I say, when I say, when I say custom claims, it's, it's actually called private claims. It is something that you just invent yourself, and that you agree on with whoever uses it. So jwti.io. Whenever you're stuck, go there. Um, yeah. That's the first part. Now let us look at. Now we need to use it, of course. So this is the Google Cloud, and I have created something called a second-generation cloud function. And what is that? It's actually just a piece of Java. It is a um, it's an endpoint that can just that will just return me the the weather forecast, and it has this URL right here. So it actually has this URL, and we have to use that when we create or uh, when we create our JWT. Because what we want to do is that we we have I have a service account. And from that service account, I have created a key in, on the Google Cloud. And inside that key, there is a, something called, it has a lot of fields, but I'll show that. And, but then there's a private key that we need. And then we can then uh, authenticate ourselves against 
authorization server. Then we will get a new key. It's actually the scenario right here. So we want to create our own JWT right here. We want to send that to the authorization server. And then we want to get a new JWT back. And then we want to use that against the cloud function and then get the weather forecast. Mm -hmm. So that is the, that is the situation that we, that, 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 yeah, that, that we are in. Uh, let me just show the code. Um, and with these uh, cloud functions, if you haven't tried them before, then uh, please go try them there. They are quite awesome, and, and they, sometimes they can actually save you a, a real application. So this I chose Java 17. And here I get a pump file, so I can actually add more uh, dependencies if I want to add more dependencies. Um, but I just wanted to keep this example very, very, um, very, very simple. So I just have this. This is the response. So we have a request right here. And then we have a response, and it's very, very small, uh, and it does not get, whenever I try to zoom in, it actually does not get any uh, larger. So that is <clears throat> that is the downside. It, I'll definitely code this in in ID in, uh, next to it, and then put the, put the code in uh, Git, so you still have the code in, on the source control management. And then I would, uh, yeah, then you can also get a font that you can connect. It's actually readable uh, right here. So here we have the response right here. And it is the response. Um, it is the response that is used to write something back and just to re return something. And in this situation, we are returning the weather will be sunny. So that is the, yeah, that is that is that is the the the, the, the response always in the situation. Okay, so we have a cloud function that always returns this will be it will be sunny tomorrow, which is quite good. Then we have something called a service agent service agent and that is because I want to um, I want to pretend that this is another application that actually needs this information uh, and for that you actually want those uh, so you want a service account uh, uh, yeah, a service account right here this is because I want to pretend that the, I'm actually I'm creating another application that I actually and the application needs that information and here I have my weather client application this is my um, this is my service account weather client application is right here and then I have some keys right here and that key is a very it's very easy to create a new one I can just create a new one if I press this one right here JSON recommended then I can create the key and then I get a JSON file I've already put, I've now we have two keys right here um so I've already created I've already downloaded this JSON file and I've, I've obfuscated it so we can use it for the example um and then have uh, yeah so let us look at how they what it actually looks like so this is my key so this is, this is a key that I downloaded from the first key and let me just delete the other key that we just created right there delete that one <clears throat> So here we have, this is the JSON key that we actually get. So this is a service account, project ID, Mike's demo. That is very, very important um, because we need that in, uh, to generate the uh, to generate the WT for, for Google Cloud. Uh, we need, I think it's in the subject. Uh, let, let us just check. Or is it, yeah. Or is it audience? I always uh, I always mix them up, but I have a code example that shows exactly where they are. And this is, this is actually what is, um, uh, what you have to do. You have to read the documentation Every time you connect to something, because these claims, the claims in a, in the claims in inside the JWT, those will be different, and the requirements for those claims will be different from cloud to cloud and from solution to solution. So it's something that you have to agree uh, agree on. Uh, yeah. So here we have the product ID, then we have the private private key ID, and then we here we have the private key, and this is the one I've obfuscated. And as you can see right here. It starts with begin key, and then it has a lot of new lines in it, backslash n. So I deleted the first part, begin uh, private key. I deleted the last part, uh, the end, uh, the end private key, and I also removed all of the new lines inside it. Then I placed that the rest. Of the, then I placed the key inside an environment variable, uh, and that is what we are going to use inside the the, the JWT uh, creation creator. Then I have an email right here. The email is important. You also need the email of the service account for your. Um, you, you both need the email if you want to uh, to get the public key. So if you want to get the public key, you need that. Uh, you also need it to generate your 
uh, DAWT if you want to uh, have access to, uh, to Google to the Google Cloud. Uh, then we have a lot of other information which we do not need right now. Um, that is a uh, this is where the certificate is. That is another story. Uh, I will not explain that right now. Uh, let us go to a. I've created a test right here and I've created some code. So let us look at what actually happens right here. I have a lot of keys right here, but um, but. What we have right here is that we actually have the, this is a private key and I've obfuscated it, but I've also, it, it still has the begin and end part right here. And I've removed all of the backslash n inside this one right here, but I, I've kept the begin, begin private key and, and the end uh, part. I'm, I'm removing it in my code. I, I can, uh, I can say so much. And then I'm using that, um, if you go to my pom file right here, then I'm using the library that we saw before, which is quite cool. This one, Java JVT from com.auth0, and it's version 3.3.0. This helps us a lot. So definitely, uh, and it's a Spring application that I have right here. So I, I've created a, a, a default Spring application, and then I've just added this to my pom file right here, and I'm I'm running everything as unit test right now. So um, I actually I did not have to use the spring part uh, at all. Um, so it could just be a a a, a plain uh, Apojo. So a proto project, uh, just a standard uh, Maven project. But uh, okay, let us see what I have here. So I have the private key which is right here, and then I have my email which is right here. Then I have my URL string right here. Then I have my audience right here. And then I am creating, I'm, I've created a JWT helper, and here in, inside here I'm generating my JWT. And this is where the magic happens, and we are going to go through that code right there. I just want to show this is overview right here. So what kind of information does this take? It takes a subject, a, an issuer, and both of those need to be the email address of the service account. The subject and the issuer both need to be the service account's email, yeah. Then we have the audience, the audience is right here, and that needs to be this URL right here. This is what will, uh, this is because the first request that we will send out is actually um, to get the, um, yeah, to, to get to get a new JWT, and that is over some, that is over two right here, and that is uh, Google's Google standard API. Um, and then we have something called uh, target audience, and the target audience is the URL of the cloud function. So this is the endpoint that we saw in, in inside the cloud function. Let me just go back to cloud function. Cloud functions right here because they have a URL that they can be reached on and it's right there. You can see that with the blue text right here. So that is the that is that text right here, weather and then some number and some text uh, right here. So this is the URL that needs to be applied as the audience, as the, uh, as the, um, as the target audience, yeah, as a target audience. And that is what, it, this is uh, Google specific, so they have something called target audience. This is not a, this is not a standard, uh, this is not a standard claim. And then we have the key in the end right here, and this, this is the private key that we have. And if we go and look what actually happens right here, uh, this, this is the, this is a test that will verify the, um, the key. So let me just go to my generate a JWT. So here I have a calendar. Here I will add 15 minutes. I'll add 15 minutes to now. This is because I want to set my uh, expiry date. So this is what I get the expiry date right there. Um, and as you can see right here, it actually uses the the old the old uh, you uh, the, the old day, uh, Java util date. Um, of course, that is a bit ugly, but that's just how it is. Um, and of course, you can't convert, but you, it's easy to convert between the, the new the daytime frame uh, library and the and the the, 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 the util date. So that is no that shouldn't be no problem. Then we have something called the RSA private key right here. So this is this is what we need to create. So we need to create a private key in this format right here. We need to have this object type right here as a private key. And that is what can sometimes be a bit difficult. So I have created this method right here to do it because it is in a format called pkcs 8 pem That is just a, that is a private key format, uh, but you don't have to think so much about that. You just need to 
know that we take the string, we take the private key, and then we read each line. And that the reason why we do that is because if if there are multiple lines, then we could then make it into a one liner uh, by by doing this right here. Then I remove the private the begin private key right here. I remove the end private key right here, and I. Um, I replace, I remove all of the um, all of the white spaces with this line right here, and uh, some of this code is something that I found on Stack Overflow. So that was a good example actually for for doing this because uh, my my first method was much more simple than that. I actually I did not have this part right here because I just prepared my own token. I just removed the, the um, I just removed this part from my private key. I just removed this part from my private key, both the end part and the begin part, and then I did not need to have this code. The same with the white spaces, but then I found this example instead, and I think it's actually quite good actually to clean out the private key um, like this uh, before before actually using it. Then I printed out just to see what's actually there, and uh, we don't need to do that. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to decode it, base sixty four decode it, and then we can then use this key spec right here, PKCS eight key spec and then we can place in the bytes right there so it is this part is i would say this is the part where you have to know a little bit about what what format do you get the private key in and you need to know about that there are different formats of um of, of your security key it can, it can be it can be located in, in many um in, in many different uh, formats then we have something called a key factory key right here, and it's RSA. This is the uh, this is standard, and then we generate a RSA private key right here, and then we return that from the key spec. So this this is it. It looks like a lot, but it's actually not that much because uh, most of the lines were actually to clean out the private key. So it's my maybe it's like uh, five or six uh, five or six lines to actually get a string converted into an RSA private key. So let's go back. So now we have. Um, so now we have created that. Let me just go back right here. So now we have generated the. So now we have created the private key. That is what we have right here. Service account private key. Then we need to build the Java web token. And this is why we use that library. That, that is why we use that cool library. Because when I add, when I give all of these informations to this method right here, then we can see this is quite easy actually when we have the right tool. So we have JWT create with subject with not before, that is the NPF claim, with issue that, that is the I add claim, expires that, that is the EXP claim, issuer, that is the ISS claim. And all of these things right here, when we, when we create this, then we do not need to think about, oh, we have to create a header that we base 64 in code, and we don't have to think about, oh, we have to uh, we have to base 64 in code, the claim, the payload parts, um, and we don't have to think about, oh, now that we are signing it, then we need to add the the, the signature with the payload, base 64 encoded, and then, and then sign it. So this is, this is the help that we get from that framework right there. So we, we save a lot of we save a ton of coding with by using that JWT framework right here. You need to yeah I will say you, you need to, to to use one of those frameworks out out there and there are so many of them. Uh, JWT is so well supported by uh, yeah any language, most languages. Um, so, and here this is the, the this is the the signing part right here. So when we sign it, then we actually get a string returned and that string is actually the JWT token and right here we can see when I create this RSA um, signature right here then I can choose to add a public key and also a private key when I am creating my JWT I do not need the public key I need the public key if I want to verify my my token when I create my token I need a private key when I verify I need the public key so that is why it's null right here okay so that was the build part. Let us go back again. So here we have generate, we have build part, and then we just return that. So, um, yeah, so in the verifier part right here, then we have a, we are building in DWT right here, then we are printing out the JWT, 
and then I verify that this um, that this that this uh, DWT is okay, and I don't need a private key to verify it. I need a public key or something called a certificate. It is the same thing. Um, Google actually provides the public keys so everyone can see those public keys. They provide them in different formats. Uh, let me just del let me just uh, delete the private key from um, from the method signature right here. So Google provides this uh, the, the the public keys in different formats, and the one that I've chosen right here is. Um, let me just show you if I go to. If I go to if if I go to this URL right here, so uh, uh, all of all of the public keys are are, uh, are available to to get from Google, and there are different ways you can get a raw. You can get a raw version. This is this URL right here, and I'll I'll just show you um, the I'll just show the examples right here. So this is the one that I prefer right here. This is the X509. This is a certificate uh, that we have right here. Um, yeah, so this is a, just a certificate, and we have we have we have multiple of them. We have two. That's because um, this this and this is the key. That this that is why it is important to have the private uh, to have the private key ID because you need to match the public certificate right here. So this is the private key ID. Yeah, I can go look it up if I go back to my Spring Boot application right here. Then I can see it had a private key ID that is right there, and then I have to find the same private ID right here. And then I need to stick to to steal that certificate right there because that is a public certificate. I can use that to verify my uh, my 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 JSON web token with that. Okay, so and that is exactly what I do right here. And the verify part is um, it is not that bad either uh, because there is something called a certificate uh, factory that can be used. And that certificate uh, factory is actually part of the um, part of the standard Java uh, library, and then you can say that you want the X509 certificate right here, and we need to decode it because again it is Base64 encoded. Why are why are we so happy for Base64 encoded uh, strings? That is because when we transfer them over the yeah, when we transfer them, then there's uh, the, then they're less error prudent because spaces are converted into some. Uh, character also local characters are also being um, also being converted correctly. So base sixty four. Every time you every time you transfer something from one um, from one server to another server, and you need to use some kind of a HTTP connection, for instance, then base sixty four encode uh, your things. Then you not uh, then you not uh, then you not get out in, in uh, oh there was a space there. And I should have added. Uh, a uh, local character there and, and all that. It is much, uh, it's much more concise. It's a, it's a, it's a concise format to, to transfer data in. And that is, of, of course, also why it's used for security uh, reasons like this. So then we need to decode it, um, the certificate because it is provided in an in encoded format when we get it. So we decode it. Then we create the certificate right here. And uh, the, the, the class type it is, uh, it is creating is actually the certificate type. So it is this is a, a, a certificate type right here. And then we can then create a, we can get the public key from the certificate. That is why that is why the, this approach is, is quite easy. Or I, I think it's easy. That, that, that's why I like this approach is because the, the certificate class has a get public key method. And then we get this ISA public key. This ISA public key is needed by the, uh, by the library that we use because they can actually say require and then again, we are creating a new algorithm. This time we have a public key and we have a null private key. And that's because we want to verify. We want to verify that everything went okay. And then we run build right here. If something went wrong, then we will get all the error right here. So here we verify. We can also add ver verifications to the claims. So it means that we can add verifications to the claims. Right now I'm just verifying the token. <coughs> but we could also add... Um, Add something with the. Uh, we, we could also add. Um, we could also require something more right here. Dot. We can say that we need a subject. Or we need a claim that has the, the, that has this and this and this. So here we can add. We can add more things if we want to verify for more for for, for more stuff. We can actually do it in, in, on, on that line right there. And that is why we use this uh, DAWT uh, library again. It, it is it is awesome. It is cool. 
Okay, so, and then we decode the JWT, decoding it. Well, here we will actually see if there was any errors, and then we will get the original JWT. This means we'll get a signature, we'll get a payload, and we will get the header out right here. And if the if it was if it was not valid, then we would get uh, an exception right here, and there are some exceptions right here, certificate exception that we have right right here. Why do we have these exceptions right here? We don't need those. Let me just delete those. So we have a certificate exception right here, and um, and that's it. So let us try to run the test and see what it looks like. We have the key. Uh, we have the certificate. Then we have a lot of fields that I was playing around with that we don't need. So I'll just I'll comment those and press play. <clears throat> so first we generate and we got a green. Uh, so here we generate. This is our token, JWT. This is our header. JWT algorithm R is five, two five six. And here we have the payload right here, audience etc etc. So we have a lot of fields right here. And then we have the signature in the end. So this is the signature right here. And it's verified, everything is okay. Okay, let us see if, if Google thinks the same, because now we have verified it ourselves, and we can actually take that token, let's say that we want to, um, let's say that we want to debug something, then we can go to jwt.io, right here, and then we can paste in our token right here, paste, and here I can actually see the same information right here. The signature has not been verified because I've not I've not pasted the public key, I've not pasted the private key, but I can see all of my claims because they're also publicly available. So this, these are my claims. This is my signature right here. I can see that at least that that's okay. That was exactly what I expected. So it's very good for debugging. JWT.io. Yes. So now we want to actually reach our cloud function and see that actually that everything goes okay, and. <clears throat> um, send request to cloud function. Let me just rename it to that. So now what we want to do is here we want to create. We, I'm using the REST template. So what am I doing right here? I am creating a header right here. So here I am. Um, so here we have the request. And this because yeah, so I have two parts right here. ID token, that is the one we get from the authentication server. So that is the first step. We send our own JWT to authorization server, then we get a new JWT back. This is this step right here. I don't think I have to show the code because I just uh, I just showed you how to generate the JWT. JWT. Uh, and the way that I communicate with the, with the server is the same way that I will communicate with the Google uh, Cloud function just with another URL right here. So here we have. I'm using the REST template. Okay, let us just let us just go through it right here. So we have the we have all of the URLs. We have the email. We have the URL. We have the audience. We have all that. So we generate a JWT token. That is the first token that we generate. Then we use the REST template right here. And that is if you are, if you're used to Spring, then you know that this REST template is an easy way to actually create a REST uh, request to uh, yeah to, to some server and here we have authorization barrel and there we add we add the original JWT we have to add a content type also and this is from the this is this is different from time to time so that's why you need to read the documentation to see this cloud provider uh, whether you're using AWS Asia whatever they, they will have a different approach to this but in this situation right here we have to add um, this content type right here, application, and then the form you all encoded, and then we have to send a body along with it, and then along with the JWT like this, and we also have to add it in the header as a bearer, as the bearer uh, value right here. And then after doing that, then we request that then we expect that we get a two hundred returned, and. Then we will then print out the header. We will print out the body, and then we will we will then we will take the ID token field because this is what we are getting back. We're getting a, a field named ID token, and that is the new JWT. So that is the new that's a new web um, JSON web token, and that is the one we need to to that is the one we need to to actually use to, to use when we uh, connect to our resource server, which in this situation is the 
uh, weather forecast cloud uh, function. So the first part was to get the JWT token like this, signed with the identity token. Then we use that token, the, the new JWT, to connect to the resource server and then get the forecast returned. So that, that is the whole story, right? Let us try to see if it works. It is green, so something happened. Let us go down. We can see here the weather will be sunny. Yes, it works. It works. It works. So that is quite cool. Uh, I'm quite happy about this. I promise, and here we can see on the, on the way, we can see here's the request with the bearer in the header and uh, all that. So that is quite good. Um, that's quite fine. And then we're posting to the address to the address uh, that we are posting to um, to the cloud function right there, and we have, we have the bearer right there. So that is, that is awesome. I promise to talk about the I promise to talk about the refresh token. Sometimes when you talk to the authorization server, then you also get along with along with the um, along with the ID token. We got an ID token somewhere. See here it is. That is from the author, author, the authorization, authorization server. Then you would also get a refresh token. The refresh token is used because um, at some point then your token is about to um, to expire, and then instead of being rejected by the resource server, and it says no, 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 this is a you get a four one on on authorized because it has been it has expired, uh, and then you would have to go back to a especially if you have a web solution, then a web application, then you will go back to the login and you will have to log in again. That would be a very bad user experience. So instead, you get a refresh token. So this means that when you are when when you can see now we are about to expire, now the token is about to expire, then you can actually send a refresh token to the authorization server. And then you get a new token that expires in 15 minutes, for instance, again. So then you get a new token without actually uh, disturbing the user with an extra login. So that is why you have the refresh token uh, sometimes uh, along with your uh, along with your real token. Of course, you can also you can also keep track of this uh, other ways. So you can see, okay, now it's almost. Uh, out there, so now let us uh, log on uh, again. But uh, that is the, the the purpose of the refresh token is to avoid um, to avoid disturbing the user with extra logins. That's it. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because we have a lot of cool stuff coming up. Bye.